Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Automating Success. As everyone knows, I'm your host, Joe Langton. Today, I have Gary Swanson uh, from Site One on the show. And when I get to do shows like this, it's really fun for me. And I think it'll be really good for you guys as the audience and girls as the audience to um, kind of see a relationship that's already been happening in the background. Gary and I, we have a huge passion for automation. Uh, Gary works with Site One Landscape Supply, as many know in the space, one of the largest or probably the largest supply company in the country. Uh, lots and lots of great people at that company. But today, I think I cherry picked the best, in my opinion, <laughs> as far as our relationship to be on the show. But Gary, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit to, to the people listening that don't know you like I do and, and help them understand why I have that high opinion well, of you. Uh, I, I don't know how to I don't know how to respond after that. Uh, very, very kind words. Thank you. Uh, well, again, my name is Gary Sorensen and I'm with Site One Landscape Supply. Uh, I started in the industry uh, with a company called Lesco back in 1988. I was a golf course salesman up in uh, your neck of the woods, Joe. I was uh, responsible for the, the, the southeastern Wisconsin and the north shore of Chicago. So I went down to Skokie and uh, out to uh, uh, Rockford, Illinois, and up through Madison and Green Bay and, and all in parts in between. Um, so cut my teeth on a Lesco truck, uh, left Lesco in 2002, and um, ended up uh, opening up my own lawn and garden center in Huntersville, North Carolina. And um, that's kind of where I cut my teeth uh, in automation. I was a Husqvarna dealer, and I sold uh, their uh, autonomous robots back in 2002. So uh, very, very familiar with the product, um, had one in my backyard and uh, did a great job and um, sold my business in 2012, went to work for Central Turf and Irrigation uh, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, great company and uh, worked for um, that company for four years. And then I came back to what I'll call back to Site One Landscape Supply uh, as, as Site One purchased Lesco years ago through John Deere and then John Deere became site one. So uh, that's kind of how I got full circle. Um, so as, as you say, uh, our, our love for automation, I've been doing it for a minute. Um, probably been doing it longer than most, uh, but I'm probably not as smart as some other folks that are on this call uh, that I'll, 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 I'll keep nameless. So, you know, I flatter you, you flatter me back. This is why I like you so much, Gary. You know, this is, this is... Well, we're both salespeople, right? <laughs> exactly. So, so first, so, so do you, you miss, you miss Illinois at all, Gary, now that you're down there in the Southeast and in, in warmer winters and anything about this area you miss? Um, you know what? I like the two weeks of summer you guys have uh, every year up there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was 75 here yesterday. It was kind of crazy. It was 75. We had a couple of touch tornado touchdowns, which is crazy for yeah. February. Yeah. And then we had an inch of snow last night. It, it totally, totally crazy mm. weather, you know? So, so. Uh, I, I do miss going up to Summerfest. That was always uh, fun up on Lake Michigan. So, but anyways, um, Great area. Uh, we live down in uh, the Charlotte, North Carolina market. Uh, that's what we call home now. So uh, happy to be here and uh, happy to be on the show today. So uh, awesome. looking forward to our conversation. So today for people that listen, you know, a lot of times I'm going through backgrounds of people in other spaces and trying to bridge uh, what someone in CNC automation is doing in this industry, just show some cool parallels. But today, I'm really excited because I hope that Gary and I can talk about how our passion for this has kind of bridged uh, a great relationship that I'm very excited about in AOS. And that's, um, if anybody's watching on YouTube, you can see the Site One logo on my AOS shirt. Um, we are actually doing a lot of work together, uh, AOS and Site One, and we are actually helping Site One uh, provide service on the automation that people like Gary and the teams that he leads um, being servants to the landscape, professional landscape space are selling. Um, so I kind of want to get right into that, Gary, and talk sure. about your guys' 
uh, view at site one on where automation is going and how it's going to be a value add for the site one uh, consumer that you guys so uh, greatly serve. So, so um, we've been looking at at uh, robotics in in the landscape maintenance business for about five or six years. Um, I remember when I, I first brought a few mowers in and uh, most of the people at site one looked at me like I had a third eye right here in the middle of my forehead uh, back in 2018. Um, and, and quite honestly, um, I saw it. I didn't know what it looked like yet, but I could see it. Right. Um, and then more importantly, uh, the market really wasn't ready for it back in 2018. Um, the market is really warming up to it now. And the reason why is because um, it's no longer a fad to have labor issues, right? It was, it was, you know what? We're going through a tough time. It's hard to get labor. Hey, we're going through a tough time. It's hard to get labor. Well, that conversation got old and everybody finally decided, you know what? I, I, there's no labor, right? Uh, and then you start to talk to um, professional landscapers and and uh, people that take care of large acreage or municipalities, government agencies, and you say, "Well, how do you do it?" and and they go, "Well, you know, I've got to put my A player on a lawnmower to make tall grass short, and it's really really frustrating for me because they could be doing so many other things to enhance our properties and manage our staff and our operations." But my managers have to make tall grass short. So now all of a sudden, they understand that that opportunity can be alleviated by bringing in robotic lawnmowers to take and maintain grass at a, at a specific height all the time. And then their A players and their B players can then do the things that they need to do. And that is manage staffs, manage operations, uh, enhance the, the environment, right? So... Um, the thing that I'm starting to really see now is that the industry is finally maybe catching up to some visions that some people have had for quite a, a long period of time. And and it's OK. Right. It, it's yep. finally starting to happen. I was on a phone call yesterday with one of uh, our directors of golf up in the north uh, east. And he said, man, this thing's going to go crazy in golf this year. And I said, well. You think it's going to be crazy in golf this year. It's going to be kind of busy, but it's not going to be like it's going to be in five years. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah that's what I was talking about today. And it's why I'm, you know, I keep telling people why I'm so excited about working with you guys is because, you know, right now it truly, I think, takes uh, a seasoned, uh, sometimes I don't like to say salesperson, like a relationships expert to basically break down what we can do to help someone. But eventually you were, he and she who has the quickest and the best way to take orders um, is going to be the most successful in the space. And, and uh, that's that's where I think, uh, quite frankly, Site One is going to be able to be very well positioned uh, by being ahead of it. Um, the, you know, something I wanted to comment to that, you know, you brought up about people starting to adopt to it. You know, in the beginning, it used to always be, we've got to get rid of somebody or um, e even, even if they didn't have a labor issue. Okay, because I think this is where, Sometimes the, the market's so different, right, based on geography, you know. So maybe in the southeast or Atlanta market and stuff, they, they have so much growth that they can't find people. But then there's other markets that they're like, yeah, we have plenty of people. Um, so now I have to decide who I'm going to get rid of. But one of the things I said the other day was how much overtime do you have in your busy season? And everybody in our space, Gary, that we were seasonal, right? Crazy amounts of overtime. So I started to say, hey, you know, what if we can reduce your overtime? And right. this has been a huge thing that I don't think anybody in the market's really talked about yet to say, hey, overtime. Like, 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 can we can we be an overtime reduction? Um, and, and that's the stuff that I think will slowly start to show in the space as more people use it. Because it's one thing for you and I to talk about, but it's another thing for end users to talk about it, right? Well, and that's just it. And and I think um you know, uh, the 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 thing that I'm excited about is 
our relationship with AOS is, you know, we're a, we're a sales and marketing company, right? We're a distributor. We, we sell widgets, right? Uh, we provide solutions for customers to make grass green or put in new shrubbery or hardscapes, irrigation, all these things. We, we have all these things that we, we help our contractors um, do their business. Um, and that's where, that's really where our expertise is, right? We have four uh, distribution centers that are 500,000 square feet uh, throughout the country so that we can turn inventory quickly and get it into our branches so that we can get it to our customers. That's the things that we do. Um, so we have customers, we have lots of customers, right? We have great relationships and we know how to sell things and move things. But when it comes to saying, boy, there's a brand new piece of equipment that has got, you know, electricity, components, all these things, right, that we don't understand, there comes AOS and they go, you know what, we understand that. So we can then go to the marketplace and we can help facilitate transactions, get people interested in it. And then at the same time, they're nervous as Deccans because... They don't know anything about it either, right? Yeah. Hey, I just bought a robot lawnmower. And I don't know what happens when the motherboard goes out or the new flock she does this or whatever happens over there, right? I have no clue. But then we'd say, hey, we got the security blanket. We got AOS, right? And all of a sudden you take an AOS who has got the service model figured out. And I like what you say, the last mile, right? Because the first mile is easy. Hey, you want a robot? It's five thousand bucks. What fill in the blank? Who cares? Yeah. What are you going to do with it once you got it? Because the day the, the hard work starts after you buy it. It's not the hard work's not getting it. Hard work is afterwards, right? Making sure it's set up properly, making sure it's installed properly, make sure that all these things that a lot of people don't even think about. But yeah. AOS does, right? So uh, I was talking with a client last week about um, an opportunity that he's looking at. Uh, and he said, hey, Gary, we, we just want to buy the equipment. We, we don't want to have uh, AOS to be uh, provide a service for a year. Uh, we don't want to do anything like that. We just want to buy the equipment. And I said, not a problem. I said, I would ask you to go and buy that from someone else. And he looked at me kind of funny, like, what are you doing? I said, listen, I do not want you to have a bad experience because this is going to be your first time you're putting your foot in the water with robotics. And if you have a bad experience, that's going to taint your whole experience for the next three to five years. So instead of you trying to embrace it and saying, how do I implement this new technology and this potential labor savings and improved turf grass quality, because we don't even have to talk about that yet, right? Instead of running to it, you're going to be running away from it. And that's not what I want to have happen. So I would rather pass up on the transaction and say, I'd rather not be involved and have you potentially not have a great experience than to have be a part of it and have you have a bad experience. So the partnership with us is really, really important that we're working together to create great experiences for customers. Now, guess what? It costs money. But you know what? At the end of the day, if you have a great experience, you can build on it, right? So um, I'm excited about the things that we're doing. Um, and quite honestly, it was interesting when I got done explaining it to the customer. He goes, you're 100% accurate. I want to have a great experience. Yeah. So well, first, I want to thank you for doing that, especially for the relationship. And secondly, you know, it's wise that you do it. I mean, the the reality is... Um, Gary, we've seen this. I mean, heck, you were selling them apparently earlier than I started selling them in 16. And the, uh, the you know, the mistake people make is it's not something that just goes and runs itself. I remember when I worked at Best Buy, the easiest things to sell extended warranties on were the products that no one knew. You know, flat screen TVs came out, everyone wanted to extend warranty on that. Nobody cared about getting an extended warranty on a tube TV anymore because they knew right. that they worked for 10 years. Um you know, and, and at the end of the day, I always think it's funny because when I look at these consumer like stores, Best Buy, well, Circuit City was there, but all of them, I mean, when you walk into Menards, they ask if you want a protection plan on equipment. 
the equipment that these people are buying sits outside. It's stored outside. It's by lightning. It's in the rain. It's uh, in extreme temperature extremes. And basically, when I think of what you and I are doing with service agreements through Site 1 with AOS, it's like somebody buying an extended service plan and turning it down for technology they have no idea to do. And one of the things I always caution operation managers on is um, the fact that, you know, most operation managers fill the shoes of an operations manager for them. So we have all sorts of data and research to know how much money it keeps to take a diesel engine and keep it running and maintained right. and a gas engine and, and adjust valves and do all that stuff. So people can plug that into a shop budget. And one of the things that we're doing that I don't think a lot of people realize, and I'm going to take this podcast as an opportunity to kind of be a little self-serving to uh, our a relationship that I have mutual interest in for once, because I don't do this very often, but is to say, okay, look, we are basically packaging it so easy to say, we're already figuring out how many gear motors you might need. And we're already trying to figure out how many, uh, or gear reduction, how many electric motors you might need, how many cutting motors. We're going to ship you the blades. We're taking all the back end that once somebody says, hey, I'll buy that $5,000 or $20,000 robot, then there's going to be somebody in operations, a CFO, a, a, a shop mechanic, uh, whatever, who's going to say, okay, but how much is it going to cost to keep it working? And right. that's where some of the paralysis by analysis is happening in the space. And this is the thing that I was so excited about. Once we really start boiling this this pot, we're, we're kind of we're starting to warm up here. You know, when, when we're doing quotes together and I'm saying, okay, and we haven't even gotten to what you guys are carrying with the ball wash system yet, but, you know, two pickers, a cutter, a ball wash system is basically $20.55 per operation hour. It surprises me even that you have people saying, okay, screw, screw all that. I just want to buy the equipment. Well, they may be worse off buying right. it and maintaining it on their own. Right. With us, it's a fixed cost. You know, it's like it's like it's like hiring people but not controlling your overtime. I'm gonna keep going back to overtime. So, you know, I, I want to see what what your thoughts on that, like what you think is keeping people from seeing what you and I see so clear. Well, here's here's um here's the what I believe. It's a totally different business model than anybody's used to doing, right? The day of buying a piece of equipment running it all day long, having a crew member jump the curb, insert how they break it, and then taking it over to the outdoor power equipment dealer and having it sit there for a week or two weeks before they have time to look at it uh, and then get it back to you. What we're saying is, is, listen, let's forget that model altogether and let's do exactly what you said. We already figured out how much it's going to cost to do this. So let's just put it in there and you're done. It's a fixed cost. Uh, I'll never forget, I was having uh, dinner one night with uh, one of the largest landscape contractors in the United States at the GIE show about five years ago. And uh, he was the vice president of procurement. And I asked him, I said, what's the biggest challenge that you have in your business? He goes, equipment. I said, really? I said, what, what is so bad about equipment? He goes, um, uh, the problem with equipment is I never know what my costs are because I never know if somebody's going to be out driving a, an engine and forgot to put oil in it and we blow up on an engine, it's 2,500 bucks. I never know when the spindles are going to go out. I never know when the belts are going to go out. And I looked at him and I said, let me ask you a question. If I could give you a product and say, here's a fixed cost that you could put that fixed cost into your p l statement and you knew that that number would never change all year long what would that do for your business he said not only would it streamline my business and i'd be able to run a more profitable business you would have all my business because that is something that i need i need a flat line i need to be able to budget what is my cost to operate right now we don't even have a cost to operate we have a budget we have a hope and a wish and a prayer, but we don't have a fixed cost. And what we're doing together is putting together opportunities for customers to say, that's it. I, I, I don't have any more cost. It's just that number every single month. And, I, and, and then, wait a minute, you mean to tell me that I can now take and go backwards and figure out how many buckets of balls I sell 
And maybe if I raise it a quarter, I'm going to put an X amount more profit into my business because I have fixed costs. This is a great opportunity for people to really dive in and generate profit for their organizations. And at the same time, not reduce labor, but reinvest the labor back into the product to make the product even better than it was today. So totally. I just love, I just love the opportunity. Yeah. Well, and and so, you know, even talking about our system and everything you were just saying, you know, essentially a lot of these companies are doing that already when they buy their trucks. Like, like for instance, hmm. at Lightinger, when, when we buy our Ford trucks, we always buy it with a five year, 100,000 mile warranty. And what happens for us is, it, it, it's in the system. If we have a hundred thousand miles, we dump it. If we if we're five years, we dump it. Makes no difference. Those are the the two factors, right? So if we have a three year old truck with hundred thousand miles, we're getting a new one. And why do we do that? Because we're buying the extended warranty, and then it allows John and I to fix that cost. Okay. And when you look at the the major companies, um, you know, and hopefully Chris will, my podcast producer, will kind of cut some of this up. Because this this will be good for for some people to see. That's nothing different than we're doing with AOS and Site One. Is we're basically saying, hey, here's this equipment. This is what it's going to cost to fully maintain it. You know, I know the one quote you and I were putting together. You want to keep it for three years or five years. That's it. We're, we're we're giving people the opportunity to not only keep their course completely up to date, move it in 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 the future here, which is where we're going, but also to be an inflation buster. The other thing is. You know, fuel fluctuating commodity, um, labor, it's it's on the rise, right? It not only is the cost going up, but the people willing to do the work needing to be done are decreasing. Right. So yeah, I mean it's really it's really a no-brainer. Um, but you know, I mean, even at the start of our relationship, Gary, you know, we were talking about robot mowers, you know. Now let's pivot a little bit. I mean, we're, we're talking about um you know, the 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 another big part of our relationship is the AOS ball wash and delivery system yep. that site one gets to sell and distribute. And you know, this is this is huge for me because as I start to build my service arm, my all my AOS people will be able to buy those ball wash systems from any site one location in the country. So another way that our relationship has figured out uh how to basically open up the dam, let's say, uh, and say, hey, look, let's let's make this more accessible to everyone. Um, so, you know, what are your thoughts on that part of our relationship? Because to me, that's probably the most exciting thing because that's an exclusive offer that that AOS and Site One have in the space. Well, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a great opportunity, right? Um, you know, you went over to Europe and uh, secured the system, brought it here to the United States, and uh, we were just having a conversation one day and you know um we we said hey we want to be a part of this thing right so uh we uh we put together the opportunity we made it work uh, we're going to be uh, a distributor for that product we're excited about it uh but what it does is it does it it adds that final touch to the whole driving range so if i'm a driving range manager and i want to get a, a a range picker to pick my range an autonomous range picker and then I'm going to get a, an autonomous uh, cutter to cut the, gr the grass. Well, that's I still got to have somebody go over there and wash the balls and clean the balls and then put the balls back into the dispensary or however, however we're doing that, however we're managing that. Well, the OS ball wash system stops that whole process now and says, okay, we're going to go out and pick it. We're going to drop them into the dispensary. The dispensary of the AOS ball wash system is going to wash the balls shoot them up to 100 yards away and put them back into the dispensary if that's what they choose to do or whatever holding tank they're going to have. So again, when I say you figured out the last mile, that was a huge miss um, in the industry to be able to say, yeah, but I still got to go out and wash the balls, right? Yeah. So that takes care of that last mile and now it's complete and we can totally automate the system. And depending upon how that club wants to do it and we've been to a couple sites that you're installing on right now and that ball is going out on the driving range getting hit getting picked up dropped into the the uh, ball wash system the balls are being cleaned shot back into the dispensary customer goes in puts a token in puts the thing and there's nobody involved yep it's, it's well and, and, and well and gary one of the reasons that i went and did that 
is, you know, in the beginning, I mean, it's funny that, that the AOS site one relationship came just after that. But while I was doing it was because I realized that in the golf space, there are so few that want to actually pick up golf balls anymore and work on driving ranges. It's a lot of retired men coming back into golf to either get free golf or just have something to do. Because at the end of the day, they hang out where they want to be. They BS with their friends and that's it. But then I realized, wait a minute, I'm 45. I see the 20 year olds. They don't even want to bend over and pick up golf balls. So how can I make the workforce that the golf courses actually have love AOS and now site one (laughs) do the hardest part of their day, which is taking golf balls from the ground and putting them into a final system. If they don't have to pick those balls up, they're in love with what we do. And, right. and one of the things in the space that I've realized, and this is the biggest thing I've realized in 16, is it's one thing to talk to a money person and a decision person about it. But if you can make the people that are keeping the places run fall in love with the automation people, you're never leaving. That right, and so so that's the way into the heart of of the of the, the the people on the range, and I believe this will be our point of automation infection. You know, because yeah. once we make those people happy, the club is going to want it every place. I I look at it this way: once once people at the club understand the technology is going to make their jobs better and easier, and they'll have more time to do things that matter with clients that's the that's the sweet sauce right because then they're going to be yeah. advocates right right now they may look at it as wait a minute you're trying to take my job no that's not what we're trying to do we're trying to give right. you more time to give a better customer experience right the only reason that chick-fil-a is more popular than all the other ones is the customer experience right yeah uh you're you're greeted every, so it's all about the customer experience so the more we have the opportunities to give clubs and give lawn care opportunity uh, people the opportunity to give better customer service and better engagement with their customers, then everybody wins. Totally. Well, and it's important for people that are learning about this relationship for the first time or learning that site one is even into automation and robotics. I can tell you that the companies that we already had in common when we started to work together. So site one sold Husqvarna. AOS already carried Husqvarna. Yeah. So it was a very easy, easy bridge for AOS to provide service for their Husqvarna product. Um, Echo Robotics, Echo Robotics ties right into the ball wash system that I'm letting Site One distribute and carry. So here we are now. Site One has the right. same similarity to be able to sell Echo Robotics uh, with AOS supporting it. So now, same thing, we have that parallel. So now right. we have Echo. Same thing now we have Nextmo. Okay. And, and Nextmo is the drop and go solution when you don't have power. So now we have the Nextmo solution. Um, so, so you know, right there, just saying right out of the gate, there's a few. Am I missing some, Gary? By the way, I, uh, Nextmo, Husqvarna, Crest, AOS Ball. Well, line. so, so there's, there's a few more that we're kind of having some conversations about, right? Um, yep. So it's interesting. The, the thing that we want, um, our customers to know, um, and one of the reasons why we partnered with AOS is we're we're going to be brand agnostic, right? Um, we want our customers to understand that there isn't a robot that does everything. An Echo Correct. will do this better than everybody else. A Husqvarna yeah. will do this better than everybody else. And a Nexmo might do this better than everybody else. So when you take a look at a property, instead of trying to take a brand and say, let me try to make it work everywhere, but I really know it's not going to be really good over here, but it'll, it'll be okay. We're saying, no, listen, let's take a look at the total environment. Let's try to figure out what is the best piece of equipment for the task that we're asking it to do. And that may be brand A, B, or C, or a combination of all. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important not only for our listeners to hear, but if there's any uh, manufacturers listening too, is, you know, manufacturers spend a lot of time and money in marketing. 
And if somebody's just looking for someone to package it together, I think you're going to agree with me here, Gary. I, I'm not I'm not here to change people's mind on a brand they like. I mean, this is like if if, if you like Ford, you like Ford. If you like Chevy, you like Chevy. I I look at this as being so early on in the space that. You know, I look at like car dealerships and think, man, if I could have a dealership of every vehicle, you're going to satisfy sure. everybody. And that's the way I saw automation. And and this is another reason why I was so excited for our relationship to really start to blossom, because I think we share the same opinion on that. You know, it's like if somebody comes, I'm sure if somebody comes to us and say, we want this certain brand, hey, that's fine. We carry it. Let's let's keep rolling with it. The, the, the foot's already, the door is already open. Right. hundred percent. Right. So uh, again, we're we're taking the road of we want to be able to provide the best solution for our customers, right? And again, uh, we we make no line in the sand saying that this solution is better than the other. It's the right solution for the application. And then more importantly, um, when when we scratch our head a little bit and say, you know what, don't know exactly what the right solution is. Let's pull in Joe and his team and let's collaborate on this opportunity. And we're doing that right now on some really big properties. Uh, there's a, a, a there's a cemetery property we're looking at. There's a couple of uh, military bases that we're looking at. And we're trying to figure out what is the best solution. And the beautiful thing about it is, is that we're a partnership. So we can work together because collaborating on it is beneficial for the customer and us. First customer, because if the customer is happy, then we're all happy. Makes sense. So, well, yeah, uh, totally. Well, in, in the, um, you know, the thing is, it's it's it, it has to serve a purpose, right? I mean, that's that's the really cool thing about automation is it once once the novelty part of it wears off. Oh, it's a robot moving around. I always say once it gets dusty, right? Which sometimes yeah. is in the day. Okay? Once it's dusty and looks like every other piece of equipment moving around on the golf course, people really don't pay attention to that much. I mean, I I know when we install our systems. There's a lot of flash for like the first month. And then after that, it just kind of blends in, which is what it's supposed to do. Right. But but doing what it's supposed to do is what keeps them coming back to the counter. Right. right. Um, and at the end of the day, that that's what we want to establish. So the, the you know, let's get into the because obviously you guys were always focused on agronomy yeah. and turf, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about the relationship and stuff, but I know for you guys, I know the people that work with site one the benefits that automation offers take the labor side is the fact that we can cut more frequently with precision blade systems. Um, you know, what, what's been your thought on that? Have, have you seen, especially golf courses really starting to take catch on to the fact that it's not only is it giving them automation, but it's giving them what they want and need without spending more money. Well, it's, it's funny because, um, Golf courses and even sports turf, right? High quality sports turf. Um, they they are very very meticulous about their cultural practices, and mowing is one of their cultural practices, right? Um, they spend a lot of time uh, grinding uh, bed knives and reels and backlapping and and doing all that to make sure that those things are razor sharp and they're getting the highest quality cut they possibly can. Um, the challenge is, is that they're usually using a 22-inch reel or a 24, maybe a 26-inch reel. And they'll get some scalping and some of this and that. Uh, but the quality of the turf is significant because of it. And um, when I want to get someone's attention, I make this comment and everybody looks at me like I just said the most stupidest thing I could ever say. And that is, you will not believe that that lawnmower right there with those razor blades that are that big will cut better than that $170,000 more. And they just look at me like, and then you go out and you put it out there and the quality of cut is absolutely unbelievable. The weed pressure is down. Turf grass quality is up. Color is up because we're not putting the plants into shock every three to five days and cutting off a third of the blade. We all know the whole rule, right? Don't cut more than a third of the blade off. Well, even when you cut a third of the blade, you're putting that plant into shock. Plant shuts down for a day or two, tries to recover. Runs is starting to get out of the recovery. Here you come again. But if we just keep that and maintain it at the same height every single day, plant never goes under stress. So yeah. you have stress. You have a stress less plant. If it's stress less, it can send out more rhizomes and stolons and all that kind of great stuff. Tighter canopy, less weeds. Right. 
So all of a sudden you say, wow, look at that. Turf grass is better. I got less weeds. It's greener. I don't have to put out as much fertilizer. I don't know. This is a guy that sells fertilizer saying, you probably won't put out much fertilizer. <laughs> it's an oxymoron. I don't like it, but it's back. So yeah. um, it's it's a great, great quality cut. Uh, and and it, it, I cannot believe the quality improvement just after a month. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And see- well, and, and you know, when you think about it, there's a lot of times people think they sharpen blades, but they just sharpen them wrong. You know, and, and the fact that automatic lawnmowers make you take a blade off and put a new one on, it's it's perfect. Every, every time you do a blade change, you know it's right. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, even on rotary blades, that they're sharp on the top and bottom. And you're like, oh, that blade, once it spins once, it's over, right? So, I mean, that, that's that's the yeah. thing, too, I try to explain to people when I'm like, hey, just replace the blades. It's like the big razor of the landscape industry. And, you know, I, I'll expand a layer into that. Like, if you were shaving your face with something, would you want to... Would you want to mess up and sharpen it wrong? No, you just you take something that you know is just cut perfectly, right? And shave yourself. So yeah. that that that's literally what these are doing. So um, you know, what do you think the biggest obstacles are left to overcome? I mean, obviously we talked, it's already getting into the adoption, right? People I don't even think we're in an adoption curve yet, but it's it's getting there. We're we're slowly I, I agree. We're we're, we're kind of gonna hit that, right? Um so what do you see in the future is going to be the biggest issues people have to overcome, you know? I think I I think the biggest obstacles are still the age-old question of how long does it take to mow an acre? Right? I get that question all the time, right? Because everybody thinks that they can get on a X mark 60-inch laser or a Toro, you know, five gang real mower, and they can mow an acre of grass in 12, 18 minutes, whatever the time frame is. I don't know. I make up a number, but my point is this they have a predetermined thing in here. And and my statement to them is what what does it matter? It doesn't matter as long as when you come back, it's perfect. And it's perfect every single time you come back. Why why do you care? Right? And then they look at you like, well, but that's not a good answer. And I go, well, it is a great answer because I'm going to do that from 10 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning while you're sleeping. And you're going to come in the next morning, and it's going to be the exact same height it was the day before. And it's going to be the same height tomorrow. And it's going to be the same height. It's going to be the same height. So just getting the mentality of change how things work is one of the barriers in the whole thing because people don't understand that it's not going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, even though a lot of the mowers now do that and we can actually say this is how long it takes, but it still gets down to you're, you're, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Think about it this way. And that's the mind change that has to happen for this thing to really go. So if that makes sense to you, because I think that's our biggest challenge. Well, it does make sense to me. And these are the things sometimes I would say it. I'm going to regret saying it sometimes. So, so I, I'm always, you know, let me put this like this. Lately, I've been regretting saying some things out loud because there's a part of me lately that I'm almost glad people don't get it. Um, but they need to get it to get adoption, right? So so here, here's, here's what I'll say to what you just said. Everybody that asks you that and they look at you sideways or cross-eyed is because they're looking at everything in the in equipment industry has gone to increase in efficiency because labor costs keep going up. So the only way you could combat the increased labor cost is to also increase your efficiency. So as long as efficiency increases as quick as the labor costs, the budget stays the same. Okay. The reality of it is the industry is already seen and we started seeing this one they made 72 inch zero turns. And also they said, holy cow, those don't fit on a regular landscape trailer anymore. <laughs> you, nobody, you, thought you, of that. You, nobody thought of it. You, you, you need a car hauler now. Okay. So, so now landscapers like myself at Lankin Group, now we're buying car haulers. And now instead of getting a $6,800 trailer back when trailers were that cheap, now you're getting a $13,000 trailer. I mean, and, and, and now we're getting $20,000 trailers, right? Right. So, so all the costs go up. And, and the problem is, I think. This is what's going to push us really into the adoption curve, Gary, is that that pinnacle, that point has hit where you can't make it any bigger if you want to transport it. 
And even in golf or professional sports surfer, you don't have to transport it. It's getting to the point where, I mean, how big is too big? You know, how much, right. how much weight are we going to carry on the turf when it's wet? The bigger it is, the harder it is to cut when it's wet, right? So, so now it's starting to be like, okay, so, so what we have to do, and this is what I've been doing a really good job of, um, but I haven't had trouble getting my own sales team to see this, is every professional landscaper, every golf course, every sports turf company knows how much is our cost to cut an acre of grass? Because that's the number they're trying to maintain. As labor goes up, they want that efficiency to keep the $44 an acre cost to cut an acre of grass to stay the same. Well, you and I know in our service agreements that we're putting together, even when you put AOS service on top of the equipment, people that are cutting weekly are seeing $25 to $30 a week right. in, 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 in the five-year leases that we put together for them. Yeah. When, when you get into golf, they're cutting that same acre four, four times. You know, if golf really took a look at the cost, if we take a Echo uh, Turf Mower 2050 or a, a Husqvarna Siora, and, and we split that cost down, they're loaned for like $11 an acre, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, we are, we we might be like, it's it's the tortoise or the hare. So sorry, I just went on a total rant with this, but this is like, I know. You, 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 you hit a nerve and it was perfect. It's it's the tortoise or the hare who who wins the race. Automation is the tortoise that just constantly moves. And at the end of the day, people will realize that's that you, they're going to want to start to bet on the tortoise. Well, and and to your point, right? So what ends up happening is as labor gets squeezed, we need to figure out faster and bigger and better things to get the job done quicker, so that we can move on to the next job and still have the efficiency of getting X amount of work done in a day. Right. So to that point, you know, at, at what point do we stop? Right. And to your point, hey, you know what? I've gone from a single axle trailer to a double axle trailer. Well, that means I got four tires on there now that when I go down the cul-de-sac and I make my turns, I'm going to wear my tires out for it. Now I got four times the expense. Right. Yeah. So all these things, no one stops long enough to think about. And well, in DO2s and safety tests and all the other stuff, too, because you get those bigger trailers. And now this happened at Langton Group. The trailer got to a certain size, and now they've all got to get safety inspected every year. Yep. You know? Yep. So, yep. so, yeah, I mean, it's like you, you get into these things. And, you know, the uh, – but this goes back to the operations manager we talked about earlier, where it's easy to just inherit something that already was there and just say, okay, well, now we just got to add a little bit. Right. Change, change the labor rate. That's what it is. You know, but there's – you know what is it, over six hundred thousand professional landscapers in the space. Look at how many golf courses there are. At the end of the day, there's just oh, yeah. there's only a certain amount of money a consumer will pay to have the work done. That Correct. Do, you know. Yeah. Um, you know. So so yeah. I mean that's um, yeah. I mean this is this is the stuff that I I wake up in the morning to talk about because well I you know see here, it. I mean here's the, other, here's the other thing that no one thinks about right. So I went to a golf course last year and I was invited there by uh, the the superintendent to talk to him about he wanted to buy a couple of robots and and put them out. So I went to the golf course and I was getting out of my truck. It was about eight o'clock in the morning. I had a cup of coffee and I'm walking into the shop and the mechanic, he had his uh, fairway mower up on the rack, you know, on, on the lift. And just as I was coming in, he said, we don't want any of them robots here. And he took a hydraulic hose and threw it down on the ground because the hydraulic hose had split. And spewed hydraulic fluid all over the, the fairway. And I said, not a problem. I said, I can tell you one thing about a robot lawnmower. You'll never have that problem because they don't know hydraulics in it. Right? So what does it cost to fix a hydraulic leak? You know, you're going to go out and cut the sod out. You're going to go buy a new sod. You're going to all go, you know, all these things go away. And nobody ever stops long enough to say, is that an added value? Is that an added benefit? Well, and you never have to do that again. Yeah. Right. Well, and let's talk about another added benefit. By the way, I know exactly what you're talking about because I I had the privilege of being at that golf course with you. But the uh, the the other advantage that I'm seeing that I I want to say out loud so that when you cite when people listen to this podcast they they think about this. I, I realized, and you said it earlier in the show that they put somebody on on a machine and they say how 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 fast can you cut that stuff that grows and they just keep getting on the machine but i always 
struggled with telling my route supervisors when I would pull up and see them on the zero turn. I'd be like, hey, put the new hire on the zero turn. I want you to walk the property. I want you to pull the weeds. I want you to do the pruning because I want you to see everything. I don't just want you to see the lines you're putting into the grass. But the response they would always come back with is, I, I have seniority. I'm, I'm not going to pull weeds. I'm, I'm cutting grass because that's the easiest thing they can do in a day. And the thing that anyone listening to this show needs to realize is when you get automation, that argument goes away instantly. There is no, well, I'm the senior person, so I should sit on the machine. Now the senior person can manage and actually just make sure the robots are cutting and actually make sure they're doing the job they should be doing. And there is no more of the, well, I should be on the machine. And this is probably the most under talked about part is I know there's probably people that deserve to be promoted in organizations from within and they don't get promoted because the decision has to be made. Do I want to take that person off that lawnmower? Absolutely. So any person that listens to my show that is someone on a lawnmower that says, I hate you, Joe Langton. I hate you talking about these robots. You're going to take my job. This might actually help you make more money. Absolutely. Because you won't stay in a dead end job. You yeah, know, listen, uh, listen it, it's all about how do you embrace it, right? Um, these things are coming. Um, they're, they're, they're all over the place. They've been in manufacturing for years and years and years. You know, robotics is not new. This has been going on for a long time, right? It's new for our industry. And quite honestly, uh, Husqvarna, uh, started this whole thing back in 1996 when they bought a robot from a guy that invented the robots. Um, so the, the 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 thing is, it's been around for a while, right? Uh, but here in the United States, we have bigger landscapes. Over in Europe, they have very small landscapes, and they call them gardens, but they're yards, right? But they may have a thousand square feet. You put a robot out there, it's easy. We have great big yards. We have beautiful flower beds that go like this and go like that. And we do great things over here, right? Um, one of the things I've found, the easiest place for these robots is big squares of grass, right? Yes. Soccer fields, football fields, baseball fields, golf courses, driving ranges, right? Big squares of grass. There's nothing in the way. They got great sight to the satellites. Everything works. That's the easiest place to put them. Um Going into residential properties gets to be a challenge. I've been down that road. It's hard because, um, you know, uh, there's twigs, there's sticks, there's this, there's that. There's Johnny's the, baseball bat. Yeah, yeah, that baseball bat, the glove. Oh, yeah, we yeah, that's right. We just cut uh, the, the flower bed a little deeper, and now the lip's too deep, and the mower goes in, and the tire. So... Um, I would say to a lot of the people that are listening to your to your show, um, I'm not saying that you can't do residential properties. Just understand what it is that you're getting into. Big squares are really easy. There's drive out the country road. Look at all those churches that got yes. all, all that acreage. Yeah. I mean, screaming for a robot lawnmower. Yeah. Right? Back country road, screaming for a robot. Yes. Nobody's gone up, knocked on the door and said, hey, would you be interested? Right. Yeah. No, well, and, and, you know, there's a whole, I mean, we had a whole other episode on that. But the a lot of that, too, is the fact that a lot of those big acreages are getting mowed by a, a one or a three-man operation. And they like getting, and that's just wide open mowing all day. They're hardly any string trimming, they just mow, you know. Um, but and, and it's hard sometimes to compete with that person because they don't understand their costs like some of the larger landscape right. companies do. But, you know, I mean, grass is what the largest irrigated crop in, in the country in the United oh, States, yeah. right? No, no. So there's so much of it to cut out there. It doesn't make a difference what order it falls in when we start to do it. And like I said, with us, it's important for people to know in our relationship, we're not just cutting grass. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're cutting grass. We're picking up golf balls. We're washing golf balls. Soon to be doing a lot more other things, uh, likely with automation together. So, um, you know, I, so I give everybody the opportunity on the show to not just talk about automation. And I don't want to make you fall short of that. So tell us, tell us a little bit about the young Gary, you know, not, 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 not the working age Gary, but 
but young Gary, tell me about your background, your family, um, when you were when you were a younger boy, and kind of get get us all caught up to speed now and your family. Well, and what you listen, like to do so when you're I, not working. Oh man, so I I I was born in Racine, Wisconsin, uh, home of you know J.I. Case and Twin Disc and Jacobson Manufacturing and you know uh, O and H Danish Kringle, right? Everything, right? Everything that was there. Um, uh, youngest uh child of, of three i have an older brother an older sister um with my opportunity in life uh, uh out of high school i was a golf pro for a while at a local a couple lo local clubs up there and um you know i could i could hit the golf ball around the around the golf course a little bit um got out of that and uh, ended up um selling copiers right so i would i was i was the copier guy man you know uh selling copiers and a friend of mine um, had told me about a company called Lesco, and uh, I I was the first person Lesco ever hired that never went to uh, school and got a degree in agronomics or you know worked on a golf course or you know had any experience at all. Uh, and I remember I used to go around and I would tell the, the the golf course superintendents. I started in the winter up there in Chicago and, and in Wisconsin, the snow on the ground. I said, hey, I you know I don't I don't know anything about grass at all I, I i don't but i'm gonna load my truck up and i'm gonna come here every two weeks or whatever my turn was now I'll, I'll just come right and i'll never forget it was probably may or yeah it was probably may and i got to a golf course and the uh, the golf course superintendent says to me says, hey gary he says uh what do you got for dollar spot heck i don't even know what dollar spot is never heard of it before right so i go uh what what'd you use the last time you had dollar spot? He goes, well, I used Baywatton. I said, well, I got some of that right there. You want some? He goes, oh, no, I don't want to buy that. And I said, why don't you want to buy that? He goes, well, I want to rotate my my chemical so I don't build up resistance. So if I just use Baywatton all the time, it, it would work. I said, well, that makes sense to me. What'd you use the time before that? He says, well, I used Dacula. I said, I got some of that right over there. He goes, I'll take some of that. Beautiful. So I go to the next place. And the guy says to me, he says, hey, got anything for dollar spot? I said, well... You ever use Dacanil or Peloton? I thought you were going to say, I thought you were saying well, what did you use last year? We don't want resistance. I, well, that's what I would have done, Gary. So, you know? so anyways, I, I, I learned the business by asking a lot of questions, right? Um, and, and it's a great business to be in. I've been in it for 35 years. I've done a lot of great things uh, with a lot of great people. Uh, great experiences. I've been married for uh, 39 years come September. Uh, I have two children, just became a grandfather. And, uh, you know, we live uh, on the north side of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. And uh, that's kind of a 5,000 foot flyover of a pretty boring life. <laughs> How does it feel to be a grandfather? Yeah, it's great. It's great to be a grandfather. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, I can't wait for him to get a little bit older so I can start throwing him around the room and stuff like that. Right. Because right now he's yeah. a little baby. So, you know, I can't do much. Well, better. time flies, Gary. It'll be there before you know it. That's you right. Know? That's right. So, well, with that, I think we we nicely filled our hour time our hour slot here, Gary. Um, I want to thank you for being on the show. I think that uh, this is probably the first of several. I, I would like to do some recaps with you, maybe sure. once every year, talking about about what we're doing and what we accomplished together. And uh, you know, unless there's anything to add for you on your side, I just want to thank you for being on. I appreciate my relationship that we've built together, not only as friends, but professionally uh, at Site One. And uh, really excited because I have to tell you that without you walking into AOS, uh, we would not have this relationship together. So yeah. I will say this publicly out loud. I'm glad Gary Swanson walked into my storefront at AOS. Uh, I don't there's, even remember how long ago now, because now here we sit on this podcast. There's, together. there's not a lot of people that would uh, echo that comment. I was glad Gary Sorensen walked into my business. <laughs> well, Gary, I know you know it's sincere, and you can see, but thankfully, we're on uh, a Zoom, so you can see I'm, I'm not uh, not sugarcoating it. I'm, I'm happy we met. No, I'm happy I had you on my show today. So. All right. Thanks, Joe. I uh, was happy to be on it. And if you want me on again, there's a 82% chance that I would do it. 